Good morning, South Union, and to all of our online viewers, welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Sunday. Today's scripture passage comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you are, living where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding fast to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me, even the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food sacrificed to idols and practice fornication. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give a white stone. And on the white stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we just, we just magnify you. We thank you that you are on the throne and that you are in heaven. Father, we thank you so very much for your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to dwell among us. We thank you for his teachings and for his life, but most importantly for his atonement on the cross. And even more important, the resurrection. Jesus, we thank you that you are ascended on high and, is, and are seated at the right hand of God. Thank you. Father in Jesus, we also thank you for your Holy Spirit, whom you have given to us to dwell in us, to live among us, to teach us, to counsel us, and to rebuke us, to sanctify us. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here. Now, Father, we pray that you would be with this message and be with each and every viewer of it, that you may give them a word of instruction or a word of teaching or a word of knowledge or a word of encouragement or a word of rebuke or whatever you may have for each person. Oh, God, please come and be with them. In your name do we pray. Amen. Today we are continuing our sermon series on the seven letters to the seven churches, reaching our third church, which is Pergamum. Now, starting with Pergamum, things really begin to get bad in regard to the conditions of the churches. It's kind of uh, on, a, on a decline, so to speak, throughout the text. And our highlight today, remember we're focusing on one thing in each letter, our highlight today will be focusing on practically investigating a crucial need in the church, specifically in the American church, which is church discipline. And we'll get there throughout the letter. So let's begin with a little bit of a background. Our church for today is at Pergamum, uh, located in the midst of a bustling capital city, about 40 miles northish of Smyrna and uh, 10 miles uh, inland of the Aegean Sea. This city is like a massive citadel, kind of built on the side of a hill or a mountain almost. Uh, literally, the name Pergamum means citadel when translated from the Greek. The city is dominated on its upper levels by a great altar to Zeus jutting out from the top of the mountain slash hill looking like a throne. And on this altar there is a depiction of the Greek gods conquering the titans. It's home to many gods, including Asclepius, the savior, which was symbolized by a snake and who was the god of healing. Into this city and into this church context comes this letter from Jesus talking about war and conquering and a double-edged sword. And the letter begins, I know where you are, living where Satan's throne is. 
There are approximately five different reasons that scholars identify this city with Satan's throne, including several written above, meaning the altar of Zeus and this god uh, who's called the savior, who's a snake god, but also the god of healing. Um, and there's a, there's a temple there to them, to that god in Pergamum. However, as interesting as this point may be, it's not the focus of the sermon, so we need to move on. And Jesus continues, Yet you are holding fast to my name, and you have not denied your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, who is killed among you where Satan lives. The point there is that this church has experienced some level of persecution and has seen the outcome of testifying for the name of Jesus, Lord and Savior, the resurrected one. And that persecution results in death. And maybe it even uh, is part of that, that, that experience plays into their downfall, which is compromised with culture. And yet even this, as important as it is, isn't the main focus, and so we move on. Jesus says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so they would eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice fornication. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. This is primarily speaking about cultural compromise, and we'll focus on this cultural compromise Next week, when we talk about Jezebel, Balaam, and the Nicolaitans all at once, and yet even now in this sermon, we move on. Our focus for today, the highlight for today, is the response given to that situation of cultural compromise, which the word given to Pergamum is repent. Repent. Change your mind. Change your way of thinking. Be renewed in your mind by the word. Transformed by the power of the spirit. Grow a backbone to sustain persecution. Wear out your knees or your chair, depending on who you are and your place in life. Wear out your knees or your chair in prayer and be changed. If not, I will come against you quickly and make war against those people with the sword of my mouth. Let us hear that one more time to understand the severity of the situation that Pergamum is in. Jesus himself is saying, I will come quickly. This is not an end times coming. This is not a second coming. This is not the end of all things. This is Jesus showing up in the church. Suddenly, right now, quickly, it's at hand. To do what? To wage war against those people with his word. That's the, that's the meaning of the sword coming out of his mouth. It's the word of God. And what sort of measure is this? This is discipline. This is God disciplining a people in order to correct them and shape them into the people they will be for eternity in his kingdom. But he describes it as war. And you know what war brings? War brings perhaps division between those who are repentant and those who are steadfast believers and those who are cultural compromisers. War leads to hurt and pain. War leads to some being destroyed and left by the wayside. War leads to others being severely hurt and yet hurt to the point of coming to a place of healing. And you know, to be honest... I would rather not have Jesus come wage war against me with his word. I don't know if anyone else sympathizes with that thought. But I would much rather church discipline having taken place upon me or upon others in the church before Jesus comes and wages war against that church or against that person. Because here's the thing, in the church of Pergamum, we have 
two people who are the problems. One, we have the people who are the steadfast believers who maybe aren't confronting or are not doing anything about the cultural compromise that is taking place in their church. And we have the second people, the receivers of that discipline, who are not doing anything with the discipline that is given, or since they have not been confronted, they don't know any better than to continue doing what they are doing. And both parties are at fault at Pergamum. And bringing it back today to our practical point, I would much rather have a brother or sister in Christ have the courage to confront me or to confront someone else and say, Hey, Matt, this is what I see. Here's the word. Go pray about it. And that is the essence, that is the cliff note version, and is the heart of church discipline. It is one brother or sister in Christ who is close to the sinning individual, who sees and confirms the sin in a person's life, who confronts the individual with the word of God, and then suggests that they go speak with God about the issue. Done in love, this is the heart of church discipline and is meant to keep people on track in the narrow way, is meant to keep people walking in the Spirit, is meant to people keep people growing in God, and is meant to keep Jesus from coming and waging war against us with his word. That is the purpose and primary point of church discipline. Now, I know when I say those words, church discipline, there are certain negative connotations to come to mind. People's memories may go back to a time that maybe even in this church, and most certainly in the broader Mennonite church and other churches, where church discipline was done in an overhanded, authoritarian way, resulting in people leaving the church or leaving the faith. Many of those instances were done as an abuse of church discipline. They were light on information, light on love, and heavy on consequences and punishments. That's church discipline done wrong. Others may be thinking, you know, I really don't want anyone telling me what to do. Why would I want to be under discipline? Why would I want someone else to come and say that there's something wrong in my life, that there is a sin in my life that is happening? Why would I want that to be done to me? And if I don't want it done to me, then I'm not going to do it to somebody else because Jesus says, love one another as you you love yourself. Do unto others as you would have done to you. Since I don't want it done to me, I'm not going to do it to anyone else. But here's the thing. That's twisting the whole counsel of God to to, to favor something that is hard to do that we don't want to do instead of doing the, what the Word says. Because here's the thing. I'm just going to read some verses from Proverbs, because it's not going to be me that confronts that line of thinking. I'm just going to let Scripture stand as it is to confront that line of thinking. Here's a few. Proverbs 10, 17. The one who heeds instruction is on the way to life, but the one who rejects rebuke goes astray. Because here's the fact. Everyone sins and everyone has a time when they need something in their life corrected, and yet the one who rejects rebuke goes astray. Proverbs 9, 8. Reprove a wise person, and he or she will love you. Now, that's the second part of the clause. The first part of the clause says that if you reject a, 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 a scorner or a mocker uh, or a fool, you'll be hurt in doing so. But notice what a wise person's response to a rebuke is. The wise person's response is, I love you, brother or sister, for having the courage to come and talk with me about that. Here's another one, Proverbs 12, 1. From the New English Translation, remember, it's not me saying this. This is Scripture. So get mad at Scripture. Don't get mad at me. The one who loves discipline loves knowledge, but the one who hates reproof is stupid. That's what the text says. The one who hates reproof, the one who hates being rebuked, the one who hates being confronted, the one who hates being corrected is stupid. 
but the one who loves discipline, loves knowledge. And we can discern here that we may not like being rebuked or disciplined, but it is the wide course of action to heed discipline carefully. Now, how is this supposed to work? How is church discipline supposed to work? First, get out of your mind all the stories that you have heard about a pastor and a group of elders knocking on somebody's door, listing out an accusation and saying you're excommunicated from the church because of it. Just remove that right out. Remove right out all of the hard, finger-pointing accusations, screaming pastors or elders or people who have just dressed down other people in the name of church discipline. Get that out of the picture. That is not real church discipline. Here's how church discipline begins. It's an understanding that church discipline involves two parties. One, the person confronting another about sin. And two, the person receiving that confrontation. First, the one who gives church discipline is not first and foremost supposed to be the pastor or elders or leader of the church. It is the leader's responsibility, the pastor's responsibility, primarily to teach and command the way in which the church should live and behave. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. It is everyone's responsibility to look after each other's souls in love. That means everyone is meant to be involved with church discipline. Every brother or sister in Christ is meant to discipline one another. And here's where Matthew 18 begins to come into play. Matthew chapter 18 instructs us, if your brother sins. Or you could say, if your brother or sister sins. Do you notice that? Jesus is talking about you and your brother or sister in Christ. Or, I mean, literally, he's talking about family members. But it's beyond family members, it's those who you are closest to in life. It's those brothers and sisters in Christ, Christ who you are in interaction and relationship with, who you have a deep, substantial knowledge of, who you are in deep relationship and even friendship with, that you consider each other brothers and sisters. It is not if someone sins against you or is in a sin, go get the leaders of the church to attack that person. It's far more relational. And second, it's go and show him or her the fault when the two of you are alone. Matthew 18. You go in private. You don't go and do it in public. It's not public. It's not gossiped about. It is not talked about with all of your friends or even all of your family members. It is not spoken of as slander. The issue is addressed one-on-one -on -one in conversation with each other. Now, how does that work? Well, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, the Sermon on the Mount, really helps us if we're looking at this in the lens of church discipline or con of um, language of confrontation. First, don't condemn, right? Remember, the word there for judge is, is really about condemning because we're supposed to discern this and that. We don't condemn anyone, and we're not, we're not judging someone else as a person. We're judging a specific action. We're discerning a specific action as sinful. That's number one. Number two, it is supposed to be helpful, that's actually the meaning behind the words when Jesus says, do not throw your pearl before swine or they will come and eat you or they'll come and trample you and devour you. The reason being is not that a pearl is invaluable and the point is not to be calling other people a pig. The point of the metaphor, according to Dallas Willard, is that the pearl isn't helpful to the pig. What is a pig going to do with a pearl? A pig can't eat the pearl. It doesn't adorn the pig. It doesn't do anything for the pig. It's not helpful. And church discipline has done in the past in such a, a confrontational, authoritarian, and overbearing way isn't helpful. 
when, we, when we're confronting another person, our aim is to be restoration. Our aim is meant to be helping another person. Our aim is meant to be, to, to be uplifting them and edifying them and building them up in Christ, even if a sin structure or a stronghold needs to be torn down first. It's meant to be helpful. And third, it's meant to co be covered in prayer. We're meant to be talking with God about this. We're meant to be asking God for the correct opportunity to do it. We're meant to be seeking an opportunity in dialogue, literally hunting for when the right moment is. And we're then not meant to knock on the door in order to receive entry into the heart of the one we're confronting. Hey, I have a, something to share with you that's been on my heart for a time, and I've been praying over it mightily. May I share it with you in this moment? Primarily, the conversation should be tender and gentle. Not about us being right or just being so righteous, but it's about a humility. And it's not just pointing out another person's sin, but pointing out what Scripture has to say in regards to that person's life. Church discipline should never, and a confrontation should never be taking place where we're saying, I think. I believe, you know, I just don't think that that is, those words shouldn't be uttered. Here's how it's been. Here's what I see in your life. Here's what the word says. And really, the, the emphasis there is, is, I'm not the judge. I may be a passive observer, I'm not a participant and I'm a passive observer. Here's what I see. Here's the word. And the end result of that kind of thing is really a question for that person is, what are you going to do about it? Because God has said this and yet your life is reflecting this. Um, a really helpful practice is even if you find it in Scripture, is literally just in the course of the conversation to be like, here, can you read such and such a verse and such and such a passage and such and such a book? What does that say? What does that mean in regards to what I have said I see in your life? Right? That is how the confrontation should be happening. It's with Scripture. Notice in Revelation the tool Jesus is going to use against the church with the, sword of his, with, his, with the sword of his mouth, which is his word. And we know that the word of God from the book of Hebrews is sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing even to the point of dividing soul from spirit and joints from marrow. It is able to judge the desires and thoughts of the heart. It is the word of God that is set up against a person's life in order to judge and discipline, not your word and not your opinion. It is the word of God that does it. Now to go back to Matthew 18, if the first time doesn't work, if the first time the person hasn't uh, learned to humble or at least said, you know, I'm going to think about that and pray about it, and then you can check in with that person one-on-one -on -one later. Um, but if the person just outright says, you know, that's not right and that's not good, then is when you go get the pastor or the elder as a witness in the confrontation. Right Then is when you come and say, hey, uh, can you please come and talk with me with so-and-so? I've talked with them already, but now I need to, to talk with them more. And the reason is, by the way, that shouldn't be just like 24 hours later. You need to wait a while and be praying for that person if they just, they've had a hard heart. And then when the time is right, you go get a, a brother or a sister in Christ to come with you as an additional witness to what's happening. The reason why I say at that time get the pastor or elder is because the pastor and elder can sometimes have a lot more experience with church discipline and a lot broader knowledge of Scripture sometimes to bring to the table. So if the person says, well, that Scripture that you're bringing up just doesn't mean what it says, right? Well, then you have somebody else who's more authoritative who's maybe be able to answer that argument that you weren't able to answer. Um, or maybe that, that elder or pastor simply has more experience in soul care. And knows how to ask questions like this, which maybe you need to ask now as well. But asking this, why is the sin taking place in your life? Why is this happening? Right? What, what's motivating it or what's driving it? 
what have you already done to get out of the sin? Here are a few practices that may actually be helpful for you in this to try to get out of the sin. Or alternatively, you know, this is the reason this sin needs to be repented of and you need to be restored with so-and-so in case harm was done with one another. Sometimes the pastor or an elder can have additional insight into that situation. Notice how the elder or the pastor, uh, it can bring severity home to the situation, but it is not meant to be a power play. Church discipline is not about power play. The only power should be coming from God upon the situation. Not a power play. It's meant to be helpful. Because sometimes sins are coming from a certain wound in someone's life. And the, 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 the sin is a fruit of that wound. But in order to destroy the fruit, what really needs to happen is the wound needs to be healed. Or maybe there's something else out of line that then causes the sin to take place that maybe the pastor or the elder can then help be a witness to and help in that confrontation again. Now after that, you can gossip with whomever you want and tell everyone in the community about it. Wrong. Gossip is still not allowed. According to Matthew 18, 17, if he or she refuses to listen to them, right? So if those two witnesses aren't being accepted or not being said, hey, I'll work with that or I need to, yes, I need to to understand and do something with that. If those two witnesses are not being um, taken seriously, then you talk to the church about it. And the church is meant to know when that conversation needs to be tender and in prayer and a whole lot needs to go into it. But the purpose is, number one, in order to restore relationship to the church. And two, it's so that the church can operate in a certain manner towards that person, namely treating them like a Gentile or a tax collector at that point, which means treating them like a sinner. Treating them as somebody who needs restoration and the whole community is involved with encouraging and rebuking and edifying and trying to build that person up correctly until that person is restored. Remember in all that, we must remember that it is our place to forgive if we have been hurt. So not everything that's done to hurt us needs to be confronted. Sometimes we just need to forgive. But if a certain sin is in a certain person's life, then we need to go and confront that. Second, if the person has heard us out and has promised to deal with the subject, but we still see the sin lingering, well, just talk with that person again one-on-one. There's no need to escalate the situation if the person is willing to work with you one-on-one in that. Okay? So there may be several check-ins and further explorations, and then maybe you need to talk with pastor one-on-one about that issue before going back to them and, and then doing things that way, but you don't escalate right away. Which is sometimes why in church you may see a sin be prevalent, but nobody's talking about it yet from the church. Well, it might be because that person's working privately with someone else on that matter. Third, sin in church discipline, it's never to be held against that person's head. You never bring it back up later on if the sin issue is destroyed, right? The sin is taken care of, you move on and leave it alone. Now, here's the thing. It matters what sort of discipline is actually suggested for the person. Remember, a discipline means a structure. It means a pattern and a way of doing something in order to rectify a wrong, in order to to enable something to be done that was not possible initially. And remember, it's meant to be helpful. So in the conversation, right, you're now with somebody one-on-one, you're talking to them about their sin, you've shown them the scripture, and now they're like, well, what do I do about it? Or maybe you need to simply suggest, here would be my suggestion going forward. Suggest to them the historic practices of discipline. Prayer, scripture reading, fasting, service, silence, solitude, etc. These practices that are meant to get people in touch with God, you don't, you, you don't start off with a heavy-handed discipline. You start off with something that the person really should be doing anyway, but maybe the sin is so prevalent in their life that they've stopped doing those things, or, or maybe they're just not doing it in regards to that issue, right? So you say something like this, will you pray about this issue five minutes a day and read over the scripture passage every day? Would you do that for 30 days. What if, what if I was willing to undergo the discipline with you? 
I will actually, in fact, pray for you over this issue five minutes a day, and I will read the passage. Or, hey, if you're working together, instead of doing it that way, you know, I'm going to be praying about this specific issue in my life that I want to have handled. I'm going to be reading this particular scripture passage that I want handled in my life. And we can work together and kind of be accountability partners. And you can keep track of my issue and I'll keep track of issue. We'll check in in 30 days. And here's the thing. Those sorts of things are extremely difficult for another Christian to turn down. What are they going to say? Well, you know, I just... I just think prayer is being a little heavy-handed. You, you can't tell me to pray, suggest for me to pray five minutes a day. That's just awful, right? I don't, I don't even have time to pray five minutes a day. Yeah, buddy, if, if you I don't have time for that, you have other issues going on, right? Like, there's more at risk here than what you think if you don't have time to pray five minutes a day because you should be praying probably five minutes a day anyway, at least, Right? I just don't like reading scripture. I'm not going to read that passage. If you're not reading scripture, then there's something wrong anyway. And if you're not willing to, to confront your sin and the reality of it in scripture, then there's something wrong. Right? There's something wrong. There's something more going on. So that, 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 uh, the other thing is, when we're offering the historical practices of discipline, right, to, to somebody else and we're willing to do it with them, it, it sounds very different than the church discipline that we've understood. But second, it offers a pathway forward for that person to grow in Christ, reconnect with God, become repentant and humble, and have God help them destroy that sin in their lives. You know, we could really just take a, a hint from the medical physicians, right? And when you're, when you're with a medical physician and they're confronting something in your life and they're like, you've got cancer or you smoke too much or you have diabetes, you know what they do? They don't just hit you over the head with a pamphlet. They say, hey, this is what you need to do. Here's a lifestyle change option. You need to eliminate these foods and start eating more of these foods. Or, hey, you need diet and exercise. You've got to start exercising more. Or, you know what, you need to do this more, this more. And you know what? Uh, for our human bodies, they don't care how much time or energy or effort it's going to take. When I talked with my doctor about my, my high cholesterol, he didn't seem to care. And now it's a she. She didn't seem to care how much time the exercise would take in my life. They said at least 20 minutes. And for our own souls, we need to take this seriously and say, for our own souls, it's worth at least five minutes. For our own souls, we also need to offer a pathway forward and not just leave the person stuck in their sin. That's not church discipline. Church discipline always meant to lead somebody in further with Christ. Not in an arrogant way, not in an I'm a better than you way, not that I'm more advanced than you or more mature with you, but let's work together on this issue because I love you and I care about you. That's what it's about. And this sort of thing is just lacking in the church because people don't want to hurt other people. People are afraid of that. People are afraid that they might upset another person, or the people are afraid that someone might leave the church, or people might be afraid that uh, their relationship is damaged, and people don't have the courage to confront one another in love about the sin in their life. And so they leave it to the professional. And the professional doesn't know everyone as well as you. That's why Jesus said, when your brother... When your brother falls into sin. And so we don't do it when we desperately need it. And instead what we're going to see is that Jesus is going to wage war against the church with the words of his mouth. Instead of having courage to confront one another in love. So we've talked about the confronter, and that's been the most practical piece. That's the piece that we probably want to know about the most. But here's the other side. What if we're receiving the church discipline? Because i am tell you the truth. Everyone at some time or another should be on the receiving end of church discipline because nobody is perfect. I myself have been on the receiving end of church discipline. 
done between myself and brothers, right? Brothers have come to me and said, look, this is, this, I, this is what I see in your life, and here's the word of God, right? This is what they have done to me. I have been on the receiving end. So I'm going to talk about how it should go, what you should prepare yourself for, and how it went in my circumstance. Here's what we should prepare ourselves for. We should prepare ourselves to be disciplined, by having a thick skin, knowing that someone is out for the good of our soul and not for the hurt of our bodies or of our lives. For the good of the soul. And not just good of our soul, but for the good of the church community. For the good of the church community. Because sin never just impacts us. It always infiltrates and spreads. It's crazy. It's wild. If you see someone living in sin in the church, I guarantee there's somebody else doing it too. It may not be what's well known, but it's happening. Sin spreads in the church. So bite it, nip it, do the discipline. And if we're the sinner, we got to be about that too. And we should, we should be loving the other person for, for talking to us about it. Not that they're being critical, because this whole thing is not about being nitpicky, right? It's not about nitpicking. It's not about being critical. It's about just trying to live better the Word of God. So we need to have a thick skin, and we need to be calm and cool about it. Not cool as in the sense of, like, culturally cool, just, just even keel about it. Just, all right, I hear what you're saying. I see the example that you've given me, and I now see the word of God. And then it's on us to make a choice. Here's what happens most times. If we're not prepared to receive church disciplines, we will be angry and defensive in the moment. And we will be able to justify our behavior until the cows come home. Right, that's a turn of phrase, right? Until, until forever, we'll just be able to justify our behavior. I know I was. When somebody, when people came to me and they said, this is what we see, here's the word of God, I justified it. Totally just justified it in the moment. I was angry and I was hurt and totally justified my behavior. But you know what? The moment in the confrontation stuck with me by the grace of God anyway. So that through prayer and examination and in the long run as I've matured and developed in Christ, those confrontations have been for the good of my soul and have led to the eradication of some things that are sinful in my life or were sinful in my life. Praise God and hallelujah that he doesn't give up, right? And praise God for brothers and sisters, or in these cases it was just brothers, who came to me and just talked to me about certain things. Glory to God. Glory to God. So be calm. Be calm. Um, and if it's a well-known sin, don't be defensive. Don't justify. Clip your tongue and pray. The second thing is, if it is something situational, right? If this is this something was just a one-time occurrence and it was misinterpreted by the brother or sister, you may want to share that in an explanation with them. Okay, that, that's appropriate. Remember, folks, people are human, and even in regards to church discipline and confrontation, people can be mistaken. So don't just take what somebody says and be like, yes, yes, absolutely, I need to repent of that circumstance. You need to take the word and examine it and say, all right, is this real? Look, this person's actually pointed out a pattern to me. Or is this real? Somebody pointed out to me in this situation. Was that, was that a sin in that situation? Did I mess up? Right? Did, or was it just a mistake? Is it something that I need to just watch out for in the future? And we need to be humble about that and examine it in prayer with God. And ultimately, a choice then needs to be made. Will we choose to fall in line with the Word? And by doing so, we're choosing God. Or will we choose our sin? Because ultimately, that's always what it comes down to. And in the end, we will not have a choice to keep both. It's either choose God or it's choose sin, but there's no room for choosing both. And so then we go back to the watchword in our Revelation text. We repent. And folks, why this whole sermon? 
Again, it is better to be disciplined by a spouse, by a close friend, by a brother or cry, by a brother or sister in the church, in a small group, or in the church as a whole, than to have Jesus come and wage war against you or against the church with the sword of his mouth. And know that the real goal is always this. Discipline yourself unto godliness so that you and we can grow in Christ. You know what? Nobody wants to do church discipline. And if nobody in church wants church discipline, then we need to be about disciplining ourselves in Christ first unto godliness, being rigorously honest. I know church discipline is done to me sometimes, and it's, it's helpful when it's been done all, all overall. But you know what? Nowadays, I just go to God and I say, God, here's my sin. Please help me destroy it. Just repent right away. Just go to God and ask him for help. And if you don't think that there is anything, go to God and say, God, I, I don't know of anything. I'm not aware of anything. Help me be aware. Tell me a sin that I need to repent of and help me destroy it. Don't wait in ignorance. Go to him first. Because it's so much different for us to humble ourselves and go and plead with God, even over stuff that we don't know about yet, and asking for him to reveal it, than for us to either know or be ignorant of, and eventually God comes and wages war against us because we didn't come and humble ourselves before him. And in this, as a church, let's begin to think and make a commitment to one another and to the church that we'll watch over the souls of our friends and our brothers and sisters in Christ, just as we watch over our own, let's commit to one another. Let's not just run away because somebody dared to bring, tell us about a sin. No, no. Let's not, let's not run away. Let's not just go to the next church. Let's commit ourselves together to growing in Christ. Let us take courage that we can help to grow each other spiritually if we take the time to discipline ourselves and if we have the prayer and courage to discipline another. Otherwise, folks, the same fate may be ours that was first Pergamum's. And that fate is Jesus making war against us with his mouth. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you so very much for you. Lord God, we thank you for this word about church discipline, and we just pray that we might take it seriously, but also just keep you and keep love at the first and foremost. Keep your word doing the work as we approach another. Lord Jesus, let us not run out in arrogance, thinking that we know to correct others first, but let us first be about disciplining ourselves. so that we can then humbly go to a brother or a sister who needs discipline. Holy Spirit, please come and help us to grow to be more like you. In your name do we pray. Amen. Our benediction for today comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 on on. Now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us go in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.